No matter what it is that you love and enjoy, somebody's got to bake it. Tonight on Whiskey Business, Assistant Master Distiller Chris Fletcher from my home away from home, Jack Daniels, on Whiskey Business. Hi, I'm Dino Tripodis, and welcome to Whiskey Business, the podcast not so much about whiskey as it is one with whiskey, but every once in a while, whenever we get the opportunity to be what I call whiskey-centric on said podcast, we welcome it with uh, open arms and, and open palates, if you will. And tonight is one of those wonderful moments where we actually get to get down to some of the nitty-gritty I'll go right to the guest bottle before I actually get to Mr. Hansberry here for a second. But, um, yeah, Jack Daniels, 27, used to be only available in Asia or maybe in duty-free shops. But now it's where it belongs, in America. <laughs> we'll talk about the 27 gold and our very special guest, assistant master distiller, Chris Fletcher. From Jack Daniels, who's with us uh, tonight. But Hansberry, a couple of notes first. Yes, I can't do the podcast without the amazing Greg Hansberry on the audio side. And, Mm -hmm. of course, the amazing John Whitney on the video and YouTube side. Thank you, sir. Uh, Reminding all of our whiskey-loving fans, uh, if if you're listening to this podcast and you haven't subscribed yet, subscribe to Whiskey Business on your favorite podcasting app. Uh, Maybe you, like, uh, over the holidays, you you steal somebody's phone and, you, you know, you're just playing around with it. And you go on the podcasting app and then you subscribe to us there. I've been thinking about that. You 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 steal you just, want you want people to steal other people's uh-huh, phones yeah, and then and subscribe, subscribe to us to whiskey business. Yeah. Okay. All right. Why not? What, hey, whatever it takes. All right. Whatever it takes to increase the listenership, <laughs> by all means. Uh, rate and review us while you're at it too. Wait, you could rate and review us on your uh, significant other's phone too. Yeah. While, while you're at it, nice. we'll just have all these crazy it's, ratings. It's good. It's good. <laughs> but, uh, subscribe to us on YouTube while you're at it. Whiskey business with Dino Tripodis. We're on the Instagram, the Facebook, the Twitters, uh, and uh, tell all your friends about us. We're we're here with all kind of fun stuff for you to to take a peek at, and just want to say, you know. Uh, a big thank you for 2019. It was a great year, and we're very excited about where this podcast is going and the great guests that we have on it, including Chris Fletcher, assistant master distiller to Jeff Arnett. Oh, <laughs> you know, there are certain names. For those of you in the whiskey know, uh, yeah, you know who Jeff Arnett is. And when when I was told that Chris Fletcher was coming, and I, and I hear, you know, master distiller, assistant master distiller, you think... Master distiller of whiskey, Jack Daniels. It would have to be some some old grizzled guy that's yeah, a beard. Been, yeah, that's been around and 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 then and in comes this. What are you? Thirty four, maybe tops. Thirty. Not quite. I'm a little older than that. So. What? How much older? Not I'm, much. I'm thirty eight. Thirty eight. All right. Still young. A yeah. young thirty eight. Young, young, young thirty eight years of yeah, age. Exactly. Thank you. Thank you yeah. for being here, man. Yeah, glad uh, to be here. Thanks for having me. Uh, assistant master distiller to Jeff Ar- Arnett, and you. you it's almost like your destiny, right? I mean, you come from a whiskey family. I do. You have roots in the Jack Daniels history. I do, yeah. So I'm, I'm very lucky. I, I grew up there in Lynchburg, born and raised, and uh, my grandfather was our master distiller for many, many years uh, back in the allocation days of Jack Daniels when you know we were kind of that original whiskey that you couldn't find. Right? Mm-hmm. Everybody was wanting to get their hands on some Jack, and you know we were actually allocated until about 1980. Um, so every bottle of just old number seven was on an allocation for every state in the country. We didn't send one bottle outside the U.S. because we didn't have enough whiskey. Um, and so we've been very fortunate to grow over that time. And um, when I think back of, you know, what a what a distiller is, of course, I'll always think of my grandfather. And uh, he started working there in 1957 and retired in 1989 as, as our distiller. And he, uh, he was a master distiller from, what, 60-something to 89, 66? 66 to 89 as master distiller, yeah. Frank. Wow. Frog Bobo. Yeah. How do you get the nickname Frog? That's a great question. So um, he grew up, my great-grandfather ran our grocery store in Lynchburg. Of course, this was way, way back in the day. And so when my grandfather was a kid, 
you know, he had to work in the family grocery, right? That was kind of his job after school, weekends and things. And there was a man that lived in the town, and his name was Frank Thomas. Well, my grandfather's middle name is Thomas. And so the older Frank Thomas finds out that young Frank, my grandfather, has the same name. And just so happened, the older Frank Thomas, apparently he had really big eyes. <laughs> and people called him Frog Eye. And so he so generously passed that nickname down to my <laughs> young grandfather. And so even a lot of the old timers in Lynchburg don't just call my granddad Frog. They still call him Frog Eye. Frog Eye. So that's where it comes from, Frog Eye. And the last name Bobo, I mean, that's connected to the amazing, is that connected to the amazing restaurant that's, yeah. that, that's down Mary there as Bobo's. well? Mary Bobo. Yeah, so Mary, she her maiden name was Evans, and so she actually married my grandfather's uncle Jack great uncle jack bobo so she's like a great great something right and so many greats for me i'm not real sure she she passed away when i was a young kid two or three years old so i don't remember aunt mary um but a lot of my family does we ate there when we went down to do the barrel oh, yeah. selection for the for the state of ohio which was a it's a, a must do a, a great trip and we ate it at mary bobo's and man that's mm-hmm. like I can't believe we actually got to go taste more whiskey because we were stuffed. I <laughs> yeah. mean, they brought it all out yep. in big portions. That's and real southern food. Oh, right there. real southern. <laughs> and then we had to go, damn it, then we had to go taste some more whiskey. Taste more liquor. Yeah, uh-huh. I'm telling you, it was a hard day. It was a hard Sounds day. Terrible. <laughs> yeah, it was. It was awful. It was great. It was one of the most amazing days of the of my life. <laughs> <laughs> um, so did 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 you 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 have a degree? In chemistry, mm-hmm. yeah. So, yeah. I mean, was there a point in your in your life where you thought you might go a different direction and not follow in the family footsteps of whiskey yeah. making? Well, you've been to Lynchburg, right? Yes, so, I have. So the city only has about 600 people that live there. Right. And even in our whole county, there's only about 6,000. So it's, it's really small, mm-hmm. right? So when I went away to college, I had no desire to move back home. And uh, I was studying chemistry. I didn't I honestly didn't know really what I wanted to do. Um, you know, things like pharmacy popped in my head, um, you know, different things. And then I went home one summer, um, after my sophomore year and my roommate wanted to go and take the tour at the distillery. So I was like, sure, we'll stay with my parents. We'll take the tour. You can learn about Jack Daniels. And so we were walking through there that day and I needed a summer job, you know, before I went back to school. And I thought, man, this is a really good job. You just get paid to talk. It's perfect. So I started working there part-time in 2001 as a tour guide, and then that's when the wheel started spinning a little bit, right? Chemistry, whiskey, okay, well, that, that's interesting. Right. You know, that's a little more fun than pharmacy. No offense to any pharmacists out <laughs> yeah, there. But, I don't uh, think any farm would. <laughs> well, well, come on, you know, there was a time where, where, where whiskey was dispensed at the pharmacy for it, medicinal well, purposes. There so exactly. there you go. Yep. Full circle, I like yeah, it. Full circle, yeah. yeah, so you're not too far off. In fact, I always said when I'm get when I when I get my tattoo, it's going to, it's going to be the the chemical equation. That's for, right. For, I bet Chris for, could help for, you out with that if we needed a proofreader. Yeah, yeah. yeah, I could certainly write it out for you. That's no problem. <laughs> yeah. Just his own handwriting. That'd be cool. Actually, just give me. Why don't you just do the? Let's just do it right here. Yeah. Right? Yeah, just give me a tattoo right now. Just I don't think you want a needle in my hand. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so so no regrets about coming coming back into the fold no not at all you know i got when i graduated um in uh, 2003 from college i got lucky because the company had an open position in r&d and i was lucky enough to get that um it wasn't located in lynchburg though it was in louisville kentucky we're part of the brown foreman corporation still family controlled by the brown family there in louisville um and so our r&d lab is there and so i spent nine years in r&d with the company working a lot on jack daniels working on our kentucky products some of our tequilas, uh, Canadian whiskeys, our barrel making operations. So if you think about R and D, you could literally be involved with any process with any product at any time. And so those nine years are really, uh, really a great time to, to learn. Um, and, and after nine years with the company, there I had the opportunity to work at another uh, distillery and and see kind of their process and you know make other great contacts and friends uh, there in Kentucky. Uh, and then that's when I got a call from Jeff Arnett. It was about six years ago. And uh, he called me up and explained that he wanted to hire an assistant. So he'd never been an assistant distiller before at, at Jack Daniels, and it sounded pretty good to me. And so I just had to convince my wife to move to Lynchburg, and the rest is history, right? Yeah, so, the rest. And, awesome. and what an honor! Yeah, it right? really. Is. I mean, from from whiskey speaking terms, to to be invited 
mm-hmm. by somebody like that because uh, what is that the plan for you? I mean, will you follow in Mr. Arnett's? Will you eventually become a master distiller? Is that the is that the goal? Uh, I, you know, I, it, I don't. It know. seems like the it seems like your path has been carved out for you, sir. Well, I don't know that I would go quite that far. I mean, we've got a lot of very talented whiskey makers in Lynchburg, and so uh, and Jeff is still a pretty young fella. I think mm-hmm. he's got a lot of years. I hope he has a lot of years yeah. left. And so, you know, I'm I'm just. I guess the best way to explain it is if you look at um, the reasons that I wanted um, the opportunity was not so much to go back home to Lynchburg. I love Lynchburg. It's a great place, um, great place to grow up. But as a whiskey maker, the level of control and capability that we have at Jack Daniels is just, it's unmatched. Yeah. And so if that's your thing is to make whiskey, this is the major leagues, and um, you know to be able to work for Jeff, that's just an added bonus. Um, I've been very lucky. I've worked with a lot of great, you know, whiskey makers, a lot of great uh, blenders. You know, know, have a lot of friends across the industry still, and uh, a lot of respect for a lot of folks. Um, but you know, to be able to work for Jeff and to be able to be back at the distillery that I grew up around, it, right. it's a pretty special thing. That's that's definitely a definitely a full circle life. How old were you when you had your first taste? I, about 21, I think. What? Something, something like that. What? <laughs> Come on. Seriously. When did you, you know, have your first I, taste? You know, I don't. I'll tell you. The first, first taste First you, taste. You've got a grandfather who's a, who's, a, who's a master distiller, and you're going to tell me that 21 was the first time you had whiskey? Come I'm going to tell you a true story. So, first taste of whiskey I ever had, my grandmother gave it to me, not my grandfather. Okay. Mm-hmm. Right? There I, you go. I had a toothache. I guess I was kind of whining and crying, and my grandma <laughs> dipped her finger in a bottle of Jack Daniels. And rubbed it on my gums, so that's I don't know how old I was, I don't remember, but see, that it's a, that's not just an urban legend. People really do that. Oh man! Oh I, yeah. Well, yeah. Before we, and I had a I had a a tooth go bad on me at nighttime, and like and the dentist was going to do an emergency root canal the next morning, but the night before, <laughs> I, I literally I literally took a, a a small rag and dipped it in and soaked it in Jack Daniels. I'm not kidding. <laughs> you know, guys, and, and put it right there on the on the tooth. You know, screw whatever salves and ointments you could put on there to, to take care of it. That's what. It, but that that saved me. There I mean, that, that that kept away the pain. And it tastes a lot better too. Yeah, <laughs> right. So, so I just kept it there on the on the on the tooth till the morning. And I try that. I go into the dentist office at seven a.m. and he's like. <laughs> he goes, what'd you do? A little cowboy dentistry until you got here is what I did. Um, let, let's, uh, there's, there's so many things we're going to get into here, and we're going to cap it off with the, with the 27 gold. First, um, you, you happen to, to, to bring these little, these little uh, plastic glasses, which are doing some advertising for the, the Jack Daniels, the Tennessee Apple, yeah. which just came out. And I asked you how this is doing. Mm-hmm. And it's very well. It's kicking yeah. ass, isn't it, it? It is. It is, you know, just exploding. I and mean, we had high hopes for it. Uh, we think we have a really high quality product. Um, we have real apples in there. It's all natural. Has real Jack Daniels whiskey in it. Um, so we do feel like, you know, we're able to put those flavors together in a way that nobody else can. Um, but the response has just been phenomenal. We're very excited for the future of of our apple flavor. That's great. And I've already started mixing them, having fun with the mm-hmm. with the apple and the fire and the honey. Yeah. yeah. At first, I did the apple and the Jack Daniels fire for a little cinnamon apple, mm-hmm. and then uh, well, I was with uh, Mr. Uh, Grinstaff in 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 Nashville, and he suggested. Uh, throwing some honey in there too yep. for some apple pie, and uh, and that was awesome. So yeah, I mean, who needs turkey at Thanksgiving? <laughs> we don't need an apple pie. You got at least. apples yeah. and honey yeah. and, and cinnamon. Yeah, so I'm glad that's I'm glad that's working out and taking off. It, it really is. You know, it's it's such a great way to bring people into whiskey because um, you know there's not many people, and maybe some people do this, but. Most of the time, you know, when you, you're going to go out and have your first whiskey, and you, typically most people won't order, you know, I'll have a Jack on the Rocks when they walk up to the bar. You know, something, this is kind of a pre-mixed cocktail ready to go. Um, like I say, with real apple, all natural, um, and it's such a such a great product. Mm-hmm. And the Jack Daniels number 27, we'll talk about this just a little bit. This is uh, uh, it, it, in Maplewood casks oh, and good. double mellowed which we'll get into a little bit more later we'll move this off to the side for just a second and 
I'm gonna hand it off keep to my, my friend Deli. Yeah, keep an eye on Deli. Yeah. Don't let him crack that open. <laughs> he just left. But uh, <laughs> but I'm very curious about what we've got here. We've got uh, Jack Daniels Tennessee whiskey before mellowing. I noticed also it says one day old. Yeah, and, yeah. and then after mellowing. Now we've never had anything uh, that just discussed this process on whiskey business before. So okay. I definitely got to take advantage of your knowledge and explain what's going on here and what are we going to be tasting and experiencing? Sure. Absolutely. Um, yeah. So we'll start at the beginning. If that's right. okay, it kind of back it up. So, you know, the way I break down, you know, what we do in Lynchburg and, and what, what, which I one, which one should we go with oh, first? Definitely go, go the before. before. Okay. Yeah, all right. For sure. Um, yeah. And the white. Go ahead. Thank you, sir. Um, so, you know, the distillery function, right? So turning grain into liquid whiskey, you know, that, and that's a, that's a big piece of the puzzle, obviously. Um, there's a lot of things that we do, very traditional, um, still you know somewhat unique anymore in American whiskey. Um, and then the second thing is the charcoal mellowing process happens right after distillation. And then the last is the barrel. And so you know we can kind of hit on all three of those uh, as much or as little as you like. Um, you know one of the things you know at Jack Angles I like to say we don't have any secrets. We'll tell you anything you want to know about how we make our whiskey. I actually feel like that's very important. Um, there's nothing proprietary, no such thing. Um, anything you want to know about how we make our whiskey, I'm going to tell you. So just ask. So we'll take this however you want to go. Mm-hmm. Um, no, man, in any go, direction. go deep, man. Just go, give, give us all. I, you know, I was actually thinking about, you know, how does how, how the whole process works. I mean, when mm-hmm. when you're making a bottle of a Jack Daniels, yeah. You know what the what what are the 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 one two three steps yep. that 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 are that determine whether or not that bottle going to make the grade. You yeah, know? absolutely. Well, it all starts with water and grain, right? So all whiskey is made from some cereal grain, no matter where in the world or what type of whiskey it is. Um, our water, of course, you saw that when yeah. you were down there. It comes from an underground aquifer that floods a, a cave next to the distillery. That's why Jack located the distillery there because there's a massive underground reservoir, about two miles worth of water underground. And we actually tank this water. We can hold over 10 million gallons of it um, just in case if we ever have a bad drought, you know, in the summer, we've still got plenty of this water. Um, and the cave itself produces well more water than w- than we need, right? There's a lot of excess. So this water, it is perfect for making whiskey. We don't have to treat it chemically or anything like that. We pump it right into our mash cookers to where it will be added with the grains right to create our mash so that's kind of the first step is the mashing process so um, the grain bill a traditional tennessee whiskey or our bourbon recipe is 80 percent corn 12 percent malted barley and eight percent rye all right so we also make a straight rye whiskey at Jack Daniels. which is delicious it is very very good uh, we started distilling that in 2011 the recipe for our rye is 70 percent rye rye grain 12% malted barley and 18% corn. So the, the malted barley doesn't change, and there's there's a reason for that, a very good reason for that. Um, but, you know, the thing is, uh, you know, the grain bill, you know, I want people to be interested enough to know about the grain bill. Um, that, that's not a secret. It's not proprietary. Um, you know, I just told you Jack is right. 80, 12, and 8. You can go home and make your own then, right? Go for it. Yeah. yeah, um, yeah. It, okay. Jack, it's, it's comical, right? I'm, I mean, I'm sure you're an excellent distiller, but you're not going to recreate <laughs> no, Jack Daniels gonna, because, I'm going to you know, try, but right? no. no. Math adds up. I go guess that much. Knock yourself out. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not saying that Grain Bill is unimportant, but it's it's comical to think that that's sure. a kind of secret um, to try to cover something up. No, I, I, like I said before, I want you to know all you want to know about our process, so... Um, the mashing process will grind all the grain on site at the distillery into like meal, right, or, or flour, and then we'll add it to that cave water in our mash cookers. And so we start with the corn, and we'll cook it to a boil. And so it's basically like making a big tank of grits. I don't know if you guys I like grits. grits. Oh, yeah. I like grits. All right, good. Very good. So what have we done in that process? We've basically gelatinized all the starches from the corn, right? So we've made like corn pudding, right? That starch is critical. The starch is going to be the whiskey eventually, okay? So... After we cook that corn, we make our grits, we're going to add a little rye, just 8%, just a little bit, just a touch of spice, not much. You know, know, traditional Jack Daniels, not a big spicy whiskey. Now, our rye whiskey, on the other hand, it's 70%, much more spice coming from the grain. Right. So then we'll cool it again and add the malted barley. Now, malted grain is critical for what we do. You cannot ferment grains just because you grind them and cook them because grains store their sugar as starch. All right, starch is a massive ball of sugar, 
hundreds, thousands of sugars all bonded together in this huge gnarly ball. Yeast will not even see that. That's the official term, gnarly ball. Yeah, gnarly gnarly ball. ball. There you go. Just, I just made that up. That's the first time I've ever said that. But, hey, here we go. It's on camera now. It's but, official. Uh, yeah, it's official. And so this massive ball of sugars that cannot be fermented. And so you have to break that down, right? You have to break those sugars off, small, little, simple, sweet sugars. Now, if we were making wine out in Napa Valley or wherever, right. we don't need to worry about breaking down starch because grapes don't have starch, right? Grapes are generally sweet when you eat them, right? Mm -hmm. Because they store their carbohydrate as these small, simple sugars already. Mm -hmm. So when you're making whiskey, though, out of corn, out of rye, whatever, you've got to break that starch down. And so we use malted barley for this. This is a very traditional process. Back in the day, you would have had to have malted or sprouted. Malt just basically means that the grain has been sprouted. When it sprouts, it creates things called enzymes naturally. Um, so what happens is, most of our, our malts coming from the upper Midwest, they harvest it out of the fields and they, they put it in tanks of warm water. So there's a bunch of little seeds of barley, right, that come in, you know, in that tank. And every little seed is sitting in there and it's got plenty of water. It's nice and warm. Well, it thinks it's still out in that field. It doesn't know that it's in a tank, right? So when it's warm and it has water, it must be springtime. What does barley do in the spring? It grows, right? So as soon as it sprouts, they drain the water off and they blow dry it. Because we don't want it to grow into a full barley plant. Right. We just want that sprout, right? right? Because that sprout will create things called enzymes. These enzymes, fancy word, but it's really simple. It's just like a pair of scissors. Think of it like that. These scissors, though, these enzymes, they only cut one specific thing, and that's starch. Now, okay. the reason that that barley needs to break down starch is because, think about it, it has to break down its own starches within that seed into the small sugars to have energy to be able to grow up through the ground, right, and to get exposed to the sunlight. Once the plant is exposed to the sun, then obviously via photosynthesis, it can create energy that way. But prior to that, when it's buried under the surface of the ground, it gets no sunlight. So this is Mother Nature's natural way of breaking down these starches, okay? Okay. So when we get the malted or sprouted barley down to Lynchburg, we grind it up, we add it to our grits. Right. That same natural enzyme cut up the starches into its components. That gnarly ball. The gnarly ball <laughs> into the little simple sugars. And then that's what we can ferment, right? Yeast will ferment sugar. Every alcoholic beverage in the world, beer, wine, or spirit, is made via yeast fermenting sugar. Right. Not starch. So we have to break down the starch, and we use only natural malted barley to do that. Yeah, I'm not. Uh, I'm not making my own Jack Daniels. <laughs> <laughs> I lost it, Sprout. <laughs> I'm just gonna let you guys do all the heavy no, lifting that awesome. yeah. <laughs> that enjoy. Well, so, so, so what do we got here? <laughs> so what we have here, right? So after we have broken down that starch. Right? We fermented it with our yeast. We have our own yeast culture that stays in our lab. We bring it over fresh every week. And that's unique to Jack, right? Unique or to whatever. Jack. A lot of people have proprietary yeast, um, but a lot of people say that, but they just outsource it. And say, oh, yeah, they have a big catalog, and they buy yeast number 108B, right, or whatever it is. Right, so right, that's, right. Their, that's their number. Um, at Jack Daniels, we have a yeast strain that we've harvested all the way back from 1938 when wow. we started after Prohibition, and we still grow our yeast up fresh from that mother culture every week for our distillery. Wow. So we have our own microbiologist bringing it in to ferment those sugars, mm -hmm. right? So the fermentation is basically like making a beer. The yeast consumes the sugar. It makes the alcohol. Literally makes the whiskey. So certainly we're not going to outsource the yeast, which no. is the very thing that makes our whiskey. Um, so another thing that we do at Jack Daniels that, that some people choose not to do. Um, I'm not saying it's wrong or right. It's just a difference that we believe in at Jack Daniels. So proprietary yeast is kind of a loaded statement, right? And so now you know what it means at Jack Daniels. So after fermentation, we just... And, and sorry to interrupt, but the, the different yeast strains affect the flavor of whatever you're making, right? Massively. Sure, so, sure. okay. Massively. Right, right, even, right. even the same yeast strain that could be stressed for any unknown for, for if you if you don't treat it well if you allow it to get too hot if you expose it to something that's contaminated with other microorganisms it's like my wife so, uh, 
No comment on yeah. that. Okay. Um, yeah, you make sure she watches this portion of the podcast. Yeah. So, it, but it, but you're right. The yeast, in my opinion, is the number two source of flavor. Okay. Right. Only behind the barrel. Uh, okay. All right. We haven't we haven't got there yet. I haven't gotten <laughs> to right. the barrel. Yeah, yet, all right. But, all right. But the yeast really provides a lot of flavor. We're gonna we're gonna taste it here in just a second. So. After the fermentation, I've, I've already been tasting already, it. I was you can say, go in. Can you, you can, not wait? You can jump the, in. You can <laughs> jump in. But uh, after the fermentation, of course, we distill it um, uh, quickly. Distillation is how we separate via heat or steam. It cooks the alcohol out of this beer. Mm -hmm. um, now, our distillation system, it's really like a double distillation system. There's a copper column with an attached pot still that we call a doubler for the second distillation. They're all made out of copper, 100% natural copper. We don't replace it with any stainless steel or anything like that. And then, you know, have to worry about adding copper back artificially. All stills are natural copper at Jack Daniels. So the only thing that touches that hot whiskey vapor is copper, right? Copper makes a cleaner, more consistent whiskey, but it does erode over time, right? It reacts. You know, a copper penny will react. If you just put it outside in the street here, it'll oxidize and turn colors. Mm -hmm. does the same thing in our stills, and we have to replace our stills about every 10 years and it's really expensive yeah. right so it's something that again we believe in that tradition of 100 percent copper distillation of jack daniels so that's what we have in this first cup and for, right away the nose like if you ever been on a, a tour of a distillery yeah. this is what you're smelling right yeah well, you get a lot of that corn mm -hmm. right 80 yeah. percent corn right grain bill a lot of corn kind of there's some sweetness there as well but the graininess really lays over the top a lot of that kind of fermentation note that you get little taste so when i roll that around i like for you to push your tongue up to the roof of your mouth it has a, it's almost slick mm -hmm. a little oiliness to yeah. it yeah and then out on the edges there's a slight bitterness corn has an element of bitterness to it naturally um there is some sweet character kind of across the tongue not really clearly defined though right um, you know, this, if we took this freshly distilled whiskey and we put that into one of our barrels, the federal government would require us to put bourbon on our label, mm. right? Uh -huh. Yeah. And that, you know, how many times over the course of my long life has that misnomer been the case? You know, What's yeah. the difference or whatever? Like, What's your favorite? You like, is Jack Daniels your favorite bourbon? I go, Jack Daniels is not a bourbon, my right. friend. Right. Well, 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 let's talk about that. That's, yeah. That, we'll, we'll get into that. So this second pour here, as you can see, still clear as water, right? But this has been through 10 feet of hard maple charcoal that we also manufacture ourselves from scratch. We burn these, this maple down into hard lump charcoal. Um, now, this process, it's, it's basically a filtration process. It's really a removal process, not an additive process. If you think about it, if you've ever used like a water filter at home on your tap water or mm -hmm. something. Or whatever. Yeah, yeah, if you could crack that thing open and you <clears throat> could see the inside, charcoal, right? Now, when you run your water through it, does it come out tasting like coal? Mm -hmm. No. Does it come out tasting like so, smoke? So why, why specific no. the maple then? That's a good question. Thank you. I don't really know, other than the fact tradition. Uh, we, you know, uh, I, <laughs> no, I'm saying like I should rec I should record. We should do more podcasts, you know, in the in the, <laughs> in the afternoon. In the afternoon, because you're very inquisitive. You're, you're normally on, we do these like at eight o'clock, and we're already <laughs> like exhausted and loaded. <laughs> at nighttime, I'm hitting my peak right now, baby. <laughs> At nighttime, I can't get a legitimate question almost, out of them. Almost five o'clock. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but why maple? You know, I think because it it grows very commonly in the area. Uh, you know, through kind of really the whole eastern U.S. So you find that hard sugar maple. Now we burn it to full on charcoal, pure right. lump coal carbon. So theoretically, any wood that you use, if you burn it and combust it fully to coal right there shouldn't be any residual flavors in it and exactly. there's no flavor in that and so you could right away you could smell it's not adding there's no smokiness no. there's no mm -hmm. char a lot of people say oh yeah jack daniels has got that charcoal taste that's the most bizarre comment i've ever heard and do you do it's this the, these these bottlings for this specific reason to, yes. to educate us simply I mean, I can't education. Go, i can't buy that in in in, yeah. in the in the uh, gift shop. No. No. <laughs> and then I asked before, this is pretty much moonshine, but 
you you guys you said you watered it down so it's not well hopefully they were a little more consistent than sure. than some of the fellows making oh, wow. in, <laughs> in the backyard in the, <laughs> it, the, the the difference is amazing it is between, it is between I'm, the two. I mean I'm tasting just again. the nose of it that yeah. heavy corn is, is yeah. it's removed it's taken away and you get that fruity yeah. kind of floral apple a little apricot even a hint of banana all of those aromas, they're in the first cup. It's just really hard to smell it because there's mm-hmm. so much of that heavy corn note. That's I mean, I would, over I would buy a bottle of this if, if it's it nice. was, as it is. As yeah. is, I would buy a bottle of this and drink it. Yeah, I mean, well, <laughs> it looks pretty, and you're really tasting the flavors that right. our, our yeast creates. And quite honestly, as a distiller, what do we really make that? Yeah. Once it's in a barrel, what can we do? Nothing, right? And I know there's a lot. I mean, there's master distillers, you know that maybe don't even have a still at their distillery. I don't know how that works now. Uh, but I think we forget a distiller, this is what we create, right? And this is really what we are controlling. Now, at Jack Daniels, because we do make our own barrels and we can control the incoming wood and everything, we do have that extra layer of control. Um, but really, this is the important part. Put the whiskey in good, it's going to come out even better. Okay? Good in, good out. All right? That's good. It's yeah, clean. It's, it's real clean. Real clean. clean. Yeah. yeah. Like I said, yeah, man. I would. I would. I would buy a bottle of this as is. Yeah. As well, you is. can. You can taste. There's nothing added. No. Um, you know, there's there's no color. There's no flavor added. Um, this does not prevent us from being labeled as bourbon whiskey, though. That's okay. a very good point, right? Right. If we truly wanted to be identified as bourbon whiskey, we would just change our label. Pretty easy. Right? Yeah. Yeah. We are bourbon. We qualify 100 percent as bourbon whiskey. But the brand is whiskey. Hmm? But the brand is whiskey. No, Bur- no. Bourbon, all bourbon is whiskey. All bourbon is whiskey. But, but you guys don't call yourself bourbon whiskey. Yeah. It's sour mash whiskey. That's what the, all, the, the, almost all bourbon is sour mash whiskey. All sour mash whiskey. Yeah. But, so, it's, so you're saying that Jack Daniels could be considered bourbon. Yes. All we do is change your label. Change the label. Mm-hmm. Uh-huh. So it's just more tradition than anything. Exactly. Mm. Yeah. Now, i got a lot of friends that make great bourbons. I love bourbons. Um I, I see Jack Daniels on a lot of bourbon lists and restaurants and sure. bars. And it doesn't hurt my feelings um, because I can't prove them wrong. You hand me a bottle of Jack Daniels and say, that's the best bourbon I've ever had. I love it. I can't prove you wrong. <laughs> yeah, it is bourbon. So Tennessee whiskey is bourbon. It can only be made in the state of Tennessee. You can make bourbon in all 50 states in right. the U.S. legally. Um, and it must see some form of this maple charcoal. Now, you could take one little tiny piece that would fit in that little cup and you could drop it into a tank with 10,000 gallons of whiskey in it. Obviously that little piece of charcoal would do nothing to the whiskey, but that would qualify. That checks the box. That's it. Yep. There's no minimum. There's no maximum amount. There's no length of time. Our mellowing process is pretty intensive because that that's the way my grandfather made whiskey. That's how he learned from the Motlow family, Jack's family. Um, so that's what we still do today. We spend a lot of money and a lot of time on charcoal. Because that's what we do. And I'll be honest, we were almost forced to put bourbon on our label in the really? 1940s. Why? The federal government came across, remember, 1940s, we're a tiny little, basically unknown whiskey maker in the Southeast, right? The government starts going through labeling class and type, you know, regulations, and they come across this little distillery in Lynchburg making bourbon whiskey. And they wrote a letter to Mr. Motlow, and you can find this letter. We have a copy of it. It's floating around on the internet if you're pretty good with a Google search. But they basically say, you know, you're making this bourbon whiskey and you're not labeling your product as bourbon. You're going to have to change your label or stop making your product. So Mr. Regger Motlow, one of Lynn Motlow's sons, once he goes out into the story and he pulls two samples just like this, before and after. Looks identical. You can do all kinds of chemical analysis. There's hardly any difference. I don't know what they did in Washington. <laughs> I don't know if they did this. <laughs> they didn't have podcasts back in I kind of like to think they did. Um, but a few weeks later, they wrote another letter back, and they said, you know what? Those two samples are different. You're right. It changes the flavor, changes the aroma. You don't have to put bourbon on your label. That was the only thing that defined Tennessee whiskey until just a few years ago, the state of Tennessee finally codified Tennessee whiskey officially as a product of the state of Tennessee that fully qualifies as bourbon. Right? right, and it must see some form of charcoal mellowing. Could be a tiny little piece, could be a whole lot, doesn't matter. But that is the truth behind mm. charcoal mellowing: what it does and what it doesn't do. 
Well, there you go. Interesting. Yeah, I mean, another well, round of applause. Uh, look, yeah. at look at this. <laughs> I just, this I just got uh, an education. That's for sure. Mike now Trump. I know exactly what to say. Yeah. Because for years I said, you know, people say Jack Daniels your favorite bourbon, and I would. Uh, apparently, stupidly say it, it's no. That's it's a sour mesh whiskey, and it's it's not. But you're telling me, it's as bourbon mm. as anything else. Yeah, sour mash is not a des- a descriptor of type of whiskey. First of all, that that was added to our label, and it's very prominently on our label. Yeah. Every bourbon distillery I've ever worked in, and it's, I've been in a lot of them, uses some form of the sour <clears throat> mashing process. So unless it specifically says sweet mash on the label, right? You're ninety percent of the time, it's a sour mash whiskey, right? Okay. So sour mash is is not a class and type descriptor of whiskey, right, at all. You've got Tennessee whiskey. You've got bourbon whiskey. Um, really, a simple way to think of it is Tennessee whiskey is just kind of a more geographically constrained form of bourbon whiskey. All right. right? Still meets all the criteria, all, right. I get all the distillation profile, all the barrel requirements, everything. To get to change my spiel. From now on, when, the, when someone <laughs> well, says you it, really weren't uh, wrong. I mean, uh, Tennessee whiskey, yes, and and you think about the 1940s, and I would love to tell you that Mr. Reger Motlow that said no, this is why we're different. That it was all about his Uncle Jack's process, right? And I'm sure there was a lot of pride in that process for sure. But I think also, I mean, if you look at our brand, 1940s bourbon was as hot then, maybe almost as it is now. I don't know. And here's this little brand unknown that's in a square bottle got a black label nothing like any of the other big bourbon brands on the market at the time and it's not even labeled as a bourbon i i personally believe this is just my hunch that as much of that decision was probably driven through marketing he wanted the product to stand out clearly just look at our right, package back right. in that day very unusual and I, and I just think he didn't want to be another bourbon on the show yeah, it's, iconic it's, 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 it's interesting if you go down to jack daniels and and you take the tour when you're in the in the foyer there you can see the uh, all the different bottles mm-hmm. through the years and that in that first square bottle you know and it's it's changed a little but not yeah. not much o- over the years yeah just subtle uh, things here and so, there. yeah very subtle things now yeah i don't even think you stepped around the corner and saw the uh the you little didn't. the little jack daniels the shrine shrine oh, if you yeah. will that's just there's there's all all my whiskey on this podcast is stored in the next room awesome there's we've had over well counting uh this one today i think we'll be at 111 or 112 different whiskeys that we've had on the show great but in there jack daniels has its own little area awesome. and if you walk in there you'll see some of the uh master distillers bottles yep. that have been come through uh uh, the, the Frank uh, stuff. The, the, we had the Sinatra Select on mm-hmm. recently uh, again. Of course, there's oh, there's a there's a bottle of uh, number seven that uh, still had the higher proof on it before they lowered the mm-hmm. proof from my mm-hmm. uncle's wedding. Yeah, that uh, I never opened up and it's still sealed. Still, still, oh. yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. yeah. I'm, I don't know when I'm going to open that, but it's the old proof. Um, there's the legacy, couple legacy bottles over there. The the legacy, the, I just had the legacy two the other day. A friend of mine brought that in. He he picked one up and and I'm always amazed how it stays, Jack. But all of these have just that slightest wonderful variation on the mm-hmm. theme, including yep. this one, yeah. which we're going to open up right now. Yep. Which I've had the pleasure of tasting this before, uh, but never had the opportunity to actually you know have it on the show but now it is available this was one of those oh you can only get it in the duty free shop yeah. or if you go overseas to asia mm-hmm. this is the jack daniels number 27 explain the number 27 yeah so the 27 <laughs> i mean it's, uh, <laughs> is, it, is it just the, is it to, yeah it's like a pulp fiction <laughs> the gold uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh-huh. uh well and and maybe yeah, you take it out and i don't want to yeah, yeah. yeah. I, and again, I'm the novice, so and maybe you're going to get to this, but I don't even know. I mean, what's the seven? Yeah, so the old number seven, we don't really know the truth. Nobody really it. knows the whole okay. story behind um, old number seven. You know, I could make something up, kind of. All right, and a lot of people know, have. Yeah, over a lot the of people years. do. Yeah, a lot of people have over the years. To be but. honest, we don't really know where it came from. Now, the twenty-seven, and this is. Um, this is a bit of a goofy story. I'm not gonna lie, but you know, I don't, I don't name the products. First of all, I just help make the liquid, and so, um, <laughs> so this stuff. is a double barreled whiskey. 
Uh, and we also double charcoal mellow it. So somebody, you know, told me, and I'm not going to mention any names one time, but they said, well, you know, it, it it's double the number seven. So 27. <laughs> <laughs> I said, Something well, like that. that would be 14, 14 yeah. but, um, but okay. Hey, you know. Um, <laughs> or, maybe, or maybe he meant two sevens. Maybe that's maybe, what maybe it was. That's what, maybe that's what the brain was thinking. Maybe that's uh, a comma yeah. in there Instead or maybe of, a little uh, act, Yeah, I'm like, you know, two sevens <laughs> it makes, make it, makes it 27. Was it you? I'm just, try- you trying, to I'm just trying to help the, the guy? I'm just trying to help the poor bastard out who did the math. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I take no credit for the name um, whatsoever. Um, well, like, apparently they signed <laughs> off on it. <laughs> Somebody did. I don't know. Um, but, that, yeah, that's, that's where it came from. So double barrel double mellowed whiskey and so this you know as you mentioned it was targeted for the asian market we did start it out in a lot of duty-free uh shops to give them something unique and something that you know wasn't available everywhere um and i think when you taste this it really has a nice soft approach to it it's 80 proof you know 40 percent very easy very approachable i'll let you do the honors sure born absolutely so the, the, the thing that I love about it, however, is it also has a richness. It has a weight. It has a mouthfeel. If I remember correctly uh, from when I had this before, this uh, you, you did mention this one's a little sweet, right? Yeah, so... Or did, um, maybe you didn't mention that. I remember this. I remember this as being a little sweet. It does. Um, with a... Mm, yeah. I really get a nice brown sugar, almost molasses. Like I was going to say... Car- car- very car- caramel-like. Mm-hmm. Rich, rich caramel, toffee, for sure. And at the same time, there's um, even while there's sweetness, there's still a little spice to it. A little bit of spice, absolutely, on the back end. So all of our whiskeys are going to spend a minimum of four years in the oak barrel. Brand new, toasted and charred oak barrel. All Jack Daniels, between four and seven years, typically. So after four years in that oak barrel, we remove the whiskey. And then we put it into a maple barrel that we also make ourselves. We make all of our own barrels from scratch, right? That's a big difference in what we do as well. We're not we're not buying the the number one ingredient. All that color is barrel, and over half the flavor is barrel. So it's the number one ingredient of straight American whiskey. And you know most companies have to outsource that. They don't have the capability to make their own, and so they're buying barrels. We buy trees from loggers. That's a big difference. Literally, with the bark still on it, we're measuring the log foot of oak every single day. We operate four stave mills, one right here in Ohio, actually. Really? Right, one in Kentucky, one in Tennessee, and one in Alabama. We're debarking, quarter sawing those staves mm-hmm. out of the logs, and then every day our own coopers make our own barrels for Jack Daniels. So huge advantage, especially when you're looking at a product like this, um, because that second barrel is a maple barrel. Okay, the maple barrel brings out those rich, I think you said caramel, sweet brown sugar, those rich sweet notes. The thing about this, being an 80 proof whiskey, very approachable and very. nice and light. So sweet. But it but it has that it has weight to it. It has a viscosity, it has a creaminess to it that typically at 80 proof you don't get a lot with with lower proof whiskeys. And you know, being an 80 proof to have that nice contrast, very light and approachable, but yes, weighty, creamy, heavy mouthfeel. Uh, the maple barrel is is really creates wow. a great profile. And now the 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 number twenty seven is available in the states as well. It as is. We speak. I know it I is. saw it down in Tennessee, obviously when I was mm-hmm. down there. But you're saying it's uh, available. Absolutely, should be available right here in Ohio. Right should too. be available at your at your favorite whiskey shop. Um, please ask for it. You know, out there if, if you don't see it. We're laughing at you. You put the lid on that thing pretty quick there, Dino. <laughs> I just. You know, I just Take the lid back off again. I'm just saying. I just say, you know, at just, first it was just the taste. Now just, we can say I love it. that sound anyway. So anytime, <laughs> that's when you know something good's coming. Right? That is good. Right, there, there. I heard you, I'll, I'll, I heard I'll you leave wait. It off. He waited until you stopped talking until you opened it. I noticed that. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's, that's one of my favorite sounds in the world is a cork coming out of the bottle. I love it. Yeah, for sure. So, um, and, and so how, this is, it hasn't been. It's just just this year that we started seeing 27 pop up mm-hmm. in, in the States? Yeah, so we've been rolling it out across the, the country uh, within the last year. And, um, it, you know, it really is – it's a really unique whiskey because of that kind of flavor contrast I was just touching on. Um, the other thing that's really challenging and why we've been slow to expand it, it's the maple barrel. 
Um, so the maple barrel, it's a gorgeous barrel, first of all. You've got those beautiful streaks of light and dark wood. It makes gorgeous whiskey, right? right. The whiskey stays in this ba- maple barrel six months to a year, basically, until we get the flavor right, and then we get it out of that maple barrel as soon as possible because they're very porous, and, and they leak a lot. They leak about as much in six months as an oak barrel will lose in four years. Oh, wow. So there is a bit of a challenge mm-hmm. with maple barrels. And so there is that balance that we are, you know, certainly monitoring very closely. And when we're, we're tasting that whiskey, as soon as we get it right from a sensory profile, that kind of rich, weighty, creamy mouthfeel, we get that whiskey out and we get it in the bottle. <laughs> As a master, assistant master distiller, and, and if you decide to become a master distiller down, down the way, uh, are there, right now, with your tenure at Jack, are you, are you focused on one particular brand of, of Jack? Or are you you're working on the old number seven on a daily basis? Or are you mm-hmm. actually getting into some of these, you know, number 27, or have anything to do with the with the legacy editions that come out or, or, you know, yeah. any, any of the other special jacks that are, they're out there. The- yeah. Well, all the whiskey production reports up under Jeff, right? My boss. And I'm part of that organization. So we've got great whiskey makers, uh, in Lynchburg, um, that we're involved with all of the whiskey production, right? Um, so all the straight whiskeys coming out of Jack Daniels. Yes, I do have a, a piece of that, right? Mm-hmm. My responsibility. Um, you know, as far as innovation looks, absolutely. That's one of the that's one of the most fun things I get to do, right? And look at different things and um, and about what could we do to you know push the flavor profile of not only our Tennessee whiskey but our rye whiskey. And and in the future, you're going to continue to see more innovation from us. Um, you know, like, like I think I said earlier, you know, American whiskey may be as hot right now as it has ever ever sure. been. You know, I, I think it probably is even more than it would have been post-Prohibition. I, obviously, I wasn't around then, but um, I just can't imagine. You see all these different labels, and because of that, because of this kind of renaissance of American whiskey, you see so many brands out there, right? I mean, there's lots of marketing, um, hundreds of American whiskeys on the shelf coming out of just a handful of distilleries. Um, you know, there's probably three, 400 bourbons if you go into a big liquor store. Yeah. Coming out of about, what, 10 distilleries? Wow. Um, so there's lots of, of stories, right? There's lots of, of, you know, marketing and different branding. Um, but when you, when you, excuse the word, but distill it down, um, it's really coming out of just a handful of places mostly, right? I mean, there's a lot of micro distilleries popping up. Sure. That's cool. I think it's really there's cool for these guys. so many cr- craft or whiskeys that the started that started popping up like these the craft mm-hmm. breweries with the beers now, yeah now you're seeing it with the with the craft distilleries with mm-hmm. the with the specialty whiskeys and the and the you know small batch whiskeys of of, of sorts but mm-hmm. yeah when it comes right down to it though the big boys there is so many you know, people say wow you guys went through 110 bottles already uh, you ever afraid you're gonna run out? I'm like, no, I don't think. <laughs> yeah. I, I think we just started with the best ones. <laughs> yeah, I think I think we'll die before we run out of uh, whiskeys to have on the show. Well, you know, I think the the big thing with me and with Jack Daniels is transparency. We want you to know how we make our whiskey. There are no secrets. Um, we we make every single drop of whiskey. We make every single barrel that our whiskey's aged in. It's all coming out of one place, um, and it has one brand on it, right? And yeah, we have this great. Jack Daniels Gold, and we have the Jack Number Seven and Jack Single Barrel. It's all Jack Daniels whiskey. So, right. You know there, there is, and and you know, growing up in Lynchburg, it's a little town, six hundred people. I mean, we don't we don't have a Walmart, we don't have a McDonald's, um, but we're really good at one thing. <laughs> really <laughs> good. And so you know, we're pretty proud. You know, we we are who we say we are. We do what we say we do, and that's why you see Jack Daniels on every single bottle. I'm debating whether or not to. Uh nominate these two knuckleheads as send them in as Tennessee Squires. You, know. you sound like you're kind of... I'm on the bubble. Oh, I'm, I'm on the bubble. bubble. Okay. I'm on the bubble. Right. Maybe not so much with Johnny, but definitely with this one. <laughs> I don't know, I, I'm not quite sure what it is, so I don't know how to defend myself <laughs> or to thank uh, you. Uh, no, no, Tennessee Squire is quite the... Oh, you can, oh okay, then I want to do it. Okay, here. The, yeah. I, I picked these up... Uh, Last time I was down, oh, yeah. nice thing. I picked up uh, this when I was in the gift shop last what, what time. What is that for the radio listeners? Mm-hmm. The Tennessee Squire, <laughs> that's right, the Tennessee Squire Association. Um, this is uh, 
what it, what it, from from one of the barrels. Right. Yeah. And Stave, the, barrel staves. Yeah, barrel staves, and then then the 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 glasses and the shot glass. I'm very proud of this. And I there get a Jack go. Daniels calendar every year, yep. and I also get fun letters <laughs> with, from a, with apologies for walking on my property to cut through to. I get a little piece of a land in Lynchburg that's supposedly uh-huh. all mine that I plan to retire oh, yeah. to on some t- you someday. Get one square yeah. inch. <laughs> one square. That's right. <laughs> one Put square inch. <laughs> Don't laugh. That's been done. I believe it. I believe it. <laughs> well, that's been done for sure. Put yeah. the ashes yeah. there. So all right, was, all right. I'll, I'll do it now. I guess I'll do it. The, the no, Tennessee. you can't do. It. You can't do it. You have to be. Oh, some, be being nominated. I, I believe that's oh. correct. You have to. Some a squire has to oh. nominate you. Yes. So, okay. yeah. I'll play the, my cards right. There's no money involved. No, you no. cannot buy your way. No, in. you, you cannot. Be nominated. Buy you have to be nominated. You're one of my favorite people. <laughs> <laughs> you know? And it's uh, and well, even if you're not a a Tennessee squire, I mean, I strongly encourage if you're looking to take a tour of some place. Really cool that makes whiskey. Jack Daniels is yeah. by far one of my. It's been one of my favorites. And this and this second time where I got to go in a little deeper because mm-hmm. we were doing the barrel selections. Right. Uh, that was uh, I was truly like a kid in a candy store. It yeah. was just amazing. I know that's yeah. that's my feeling every day at work, pretty much. Mm-hmm. So. It's, yeah, it's I was cool. telling uh, to a friend of mine. He was uh, he was uh, someplace at a, at, a, at another distillery and and he took a tour. Mm-hmm. And he goes, great staff, you know, great people. And I was like, you know what? I, I, I texted him back. I go, whiskey people generally are happy people. Right. Yeah. I mean, anybody that we've had on this show that's talked about the the business of selling or making whiskey, be they an ambassador or uh, from the distilling aspect of yourself, um, they're, they love their job. They're happy, happy people. Yeah. I've not had a depressed whiskey person <laughs> yet <laughs> yeah other, other that's than in the me. gin world that's in the gin world <laughs> yeah, yeah. well but i think that plays into the um part of it is the storytelling like we've been talking about the first thing i wrote down was oral history everybody has a story to tell yeah. and it's in your family and your friends and this long history and i mean that's got to be a fun cool thing to be a part of it is you know and, and and there's such it's such a um you know it's such a gentleman's industry in a lot of ways you know i've got friends working in a lot of different distilleries um, in the industry, and I've worked in a lot of different distillers. I've been very lucky to work with people, um, you know, across, you know, multiple distilleries and distillers and things. And so, um, you know, I will say if people have questions about what we do in Lynchburg and, and, and you would think there's all these secrets and all this proprietary stuff, and at least as far as we're concerned, there's not. Um, and we collaborate and we talk and we're friends. Mm-hmm. I mean, sure, is it is it a friendly rivalry? Maybe a little bit. Oh, sure. Um, but, you know, if, if uh, you know, they say a, a rising tide lifts all ships. And, and I think, you know, everybody, you know, in the American whiskey industry right now, we're enjoying that um, as a whole. Um, so I think it's a great time for American whiskey. It's a great time for Tennessee whiskeys. Yeah. Uh, we now have like 40 distilleries in the state. They're not oh. all making Tennessee whiskey. Um, but a lot of them are. Um, so, it, you know, it's, it's it's really a great time to be an American whiskey drinker. Well, I appreciate you coming by Whiskey Business this afternoon. Uh, how often are you on the road? I mean, what do you what, you got to you have to do something later tonight, right? Yeah, yeah so we yeah. have we're going to a dinner later on, a whiskey dinner tonight. So and, then you'll, and you'll be talking be about this whole process. And yeah, different thing. You know, I like to take it however folks want to want to take it. Um, mm-hmm. You know, I love to talk about how we make our whiskey. I, you know, to me, um, that's the most important thing. Ask questions. Ask how the mashing process and the fermentation and the distillation and the barrels ask questions and know what goes in there. You know, I think, you know, as a producer, that's what we owe um, the, the consumers, the people that enjoy our product. I want them to know how we make our whiskey. I think it's important. Um, I'm a distiller. That's what I do. Maybe that's why. And I how often are you on the road doing what you, what you like, you're sitting here uh, talking I, I with I travel us, about 80 days a year or so, okay, something so like not. that. And the rest so, of the time you're in Lynchburg, in Lynchburg yeah. making whiskey. Yeah. So Jeff travels um, usually less than that, about half as much as I do. 40 to 50 days. I'm usually about 80 days on the road. So. Nice. Well, man, we sincerely appreciate uh, thank you. you taking the time out. I want to thank you, Chris Fletcher. I want to thank Jeff Fulham for putting it together again. Again, he he's uh, he's come through for us like about three or four different times now with uh, uh, different uh, Brown Foreman people yeah. who, uh, to come over here and and grace us with their presence and their 
their knowledge. We'll keep him around. Yeah, keep him around for <laughs> sure, man. He's a, and he sits there so quietly and doesn't want to be a part of anything, and yet <laughs> he's been instrumental in getting great people like yourself here. So thank you, Jeff. I appreciate it, buddy, so much. I appreciate it. Um, Whiskey Business is a Never the Luck production produced on the audio side by Greg Hansberry. And I just want to make a note. Will, uh, you mentioned your, uh, your Jack Shrine. We'll get a photograph with, with maybe with you, Chris, and we'll put yeah. that on the Instagram page and, and uh, visuals. We so. can do that, yeah. Uh, just, uh, just I don't know if this bottle there. is staying or going, but if it's staying, I'm going to have to make, gonna some, make some room for make it. Make some room. you got to get a bigger bigger shrine. Maybe we'll do a little <laughs> ceremonial placement. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever the case might be. And also, don't forget, uh, as you mentioned earlier, the social media. Is yeah, right. Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, uh, YouTube, Whiskey Business with Dino Tripodis, and subscribe on your favorite uh, podcasting platform. Which is Thank done you. magnificently, the Whiskey Business with Dino Tripodis on YouTube by the amazing John Whitney. The premise. The premise. Third of, Thursday. The third Thursday of every month at uh, Shadowbox Live on the upfront stage. Our little uh, our little baby offshoot podcast where we have a lot of fun on that too. It's still whiskey related, but more comedy related. I'll tell you about it after we get off the air here. <laughs> but um, our guest bottle has been Jack Daniels number twenty seven, which is now available in America. No longer have to go to Europe to get it or Asia, wherever the case might be. So we're thrilled about that. And our very special guest has been. Chris Fletcher, Assistant Master Distiller. Bravo. Well done. Well done. And so, my friends, until the next bottle, see ya.